This is Ham College, episode 33 for September 30th, 2017. This episode of Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Now's the time to review your communications plans and make sure your ICOM equipment is ready to go. And by hamstudy.org, a great way to study for your next license exam. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. <laughs> we, we, we really need some new material. We do. <laughs> that one just works so well, though. Yeah, you know? it's getting kind of worn out, though. Yeah, it is. I told my wife earlier that, you know, it just never gets old, but I think I probably lied, didn't I? You may have. Well, we've got um, a fun show lined up tonight. We've got some oscilloscope action coming up. All right, that's always we'll, fun. Yeah. A little further into the show, got uh, a group of folks over there in the chat room hanging out, and uh, well, I guess they're chatting in there. They are. While they watch the show, so if we get anything wrong, Tommy, I got a feeling we're going to get buzzed by the chat room. It's happened uh, before. Yeah. I'm sure it'll happen again. But, uh, it, you know, if you're watching the live stream, go over to amateurlogic.tv slash chat. Uh, join in there, and... Uh, Enjoy the chat and give us your answers as we go through the questions here. I'll give you a hint. It's either going to be A, B, C, or D. One of those four choices yep. every it's time. It's a good, good, uh, good yep. chance you're right. So, what did we talk about on the last show, Tommy? Uh, last one, we, uh, I think we finally finished up the last of the band plan things, if I remember right. Because that kind of came back around after we thought it was, was yeah. gone. It just wouldn't go away. It just, you know, no, just, and it may come back <laughs> around again. You just can't ever tell. And then uh, we did uh, capacitors. We did. Talked a little about capacitors, and we talked about the amateur auxiliary as well. Oh, that's right. We sure and, did. Uh, what that is. So uh, this week, we're moving on. At least we're making progress. And I don't know that it's written down here exactly what we're going to cover, but I can tell you there's a few rules on this one. They're, they're always fun. We're going to be talking about last week was capacitors. What do you think it'll be this in, week? Well, seeing as how I'm looking at what's here in front of the oscilloscope, I'm thinking it's inductors. Okay. I'm thinking you're right. Yeah. Dead giveaway right there. Yep. Probably so. Uh, somebody's, oh, they're wanting to know. Uh, is the buzzer handy? Is the buzzer handy? The virtual buzzer is always yeah. handy. Yeah, the virtual one. We have to edit it in afterwards. Yeah. One day, you know, that's. I was thinking about that this afternoon. I need to go ahead and do my Arduino uh, project. I found a perfect sketch there. It's a, a sample player made to be used like a, a, a keyboard, mm -hmm. maybe a keyboard or something. And I could load all our buzzers and different effects that we need into that and we could just use an Arduino for that. That'd be perfect. That'd be a cool project. Yeah, perfect project. You know, I couldn't get it to do the slides because it wouldn't key right with our switch. Oh, you mean the Raspberry Pi though, not the uh, Arduino. Right, the Raspberry Pi. I don't know why I said Arduino. Uh, got Arduino on my mind. I haven't touched mine and Yeah, I've you know, been playing around with mine. I got a bunch of parts in this months, week. Yeah. Uh, be doing some uh, Arduino stuff on Amateur Logic coming up here pretty quick. I've just been back on the Raspberry Pi, man. I'm having a, a lot of uh, Pi action yeah. here lately. Yeah, enjoying it, man. The three is just so much faster than. You had the, to back off the Pi. Uh, you got to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you ready to get on into the questions? I'm about as ready as I'm going to get. When choosing a transmitting frequency, what should you do to comply with good amateur practice? A, ensure that the frequency and mode selected are within your license class privileges. 
B. Follow generally accepted band plans agreed to by the amateur radio community. C. Monitor the frequency before transmitting. Or D. All of these choices are correct. What do you well, think? ensure that the frequency and mode are within your license privileges. You always need to do that, so that's yeah. a great thing. Follow generally accepted band plans. That's a good thing, too. And monitor your frequency before transmitting. We covered that stuff all the way back in the technician, so it's got to be mm -hmm. D. All of these are correct. I don't think you'll get any arguments on that. Everybody in the chat room over here is saying D. Uh, all of those are, are good answers, so yeah, it's it's got to be all of these. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. There we, that that was a we'll virtual the, sound effect we'll right there. We get those while we can. Yeah. When we get into those <laughs> rules, it's probably gonna, not, not going to happen. No. All right. You got one for me? I sure do. When may music be transmitted by an amateur station? A, at any time, as long as it produces no spurious emissions. B, when it is unintentionally transmitted from the background of the transmitter. C, when it is transmitted on frequencies above uh, 12, 15 megahertz. Or D, when it's an incidental part of a manned spacecraft retransmission. And I just happen to know the answer to this one, Tommy, because... Uh, I think the same question, or a very similar one, was uh, on the technician questions when we were going over those. Mm -hmm. There's a similar one in there. Mm -hmm. uh, at any time, as long as it produces no spurious emissions, no. <laughs> it's, uh, you can never transmit music on amateur radio. Although there is a band called Spurious Emissions that usually there play is. at Dayton. There is. That's correct. B, it is unintentionally transmitted from the background at the transmitter. That means maybe there's a radio or a TV mm -hmm. playing in the background. No, really, that's not legal either. No. Um, although it happens. Uh, C, when it is transmitted on frequencies above 12, 15 megahertz. Doing it above 1.2 gigs is not, that doesn't change the rules any. No. no. So it's going to be D, uh, when it's an incidental part of a manned spacecraft retransmission. And everybody got that over in the chat room. That's the answer, Tommy. I mean... Uh, oh, yeah, that's got to be it. Yeah. So that, that's all I can say about that. All right, there there's one go. There's one for you. And then uh, <laughs> when the rules start, like I said, those will probably stop. So I'm on my own now? You're on your own. Okay. <laughs> When is an amateur station permitted to transmit secret codes? A, during a declared communications emergency. B, to control a space station. C, only when the information is of a routine, a personal nature. Or D, only with special temporary authorization from the FCC. Oh boy. Okay, so I'm gonna have to break these down here. During a declared communications emergency, I just don't think you would have to have secret codes over amateur radio for that. To control a space station? I don't know. See, when only when the information is of routine pers or personal nature, it should, still shouldn't be um, encrypted or encoded where people can't understand. And only with temporary authorization from the FCC, and I've never heard of that. I want to say, I want to say it's, I don't know what I want to say. I think it's B, but I don't know why. To control a space station? Yeah, I, I, have, I don't have a space station, so I'm not yeah. really sure if that's it. Could you control somebody else's? <clears throat> If well, the reason the I codes. say, the, that's what I'm going to say. The reason I say that is if you were sending, you know, some type of commands to control, to control mm -hmm. it, you wouldn't want just anybody being able to do that. That yeah, wouldn't be, be good. Um, so that's got to be the, only, the reason why. Well, I'm going to agree with you just like everyone else in the chat room did. It is to control a space station. And, you know, this question was on the technician exam, too, or one very similar to it. 
because I, 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 I remember it. I don't know that it was worded space station. Uh, maybe it was, but you know, right off that's. I'm thinking about the International Space Station or some of those. Of course, we, you know, we can't control those. But I, I think this is more like near space, maybe balloons or, you know. I don't know. Maybe, the, maybe we maybe, need to build or, a space station on Amateur Logic and try yeah, it out. Or some near-Earth orbit satellites, something like that. What are the restrictions on the use of abbreviations or procedural signals in the amateur service? A, only Q signals are permitted. B, they may be used if they do not obscure the meaning of a message. C, they're not permitted. Or D, only 10 codes are permitted. Yeah, okay. I'm thinking that D one probably get you some ridicule. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't really want to go on ham radio with your 10 fours and 10 sevens and, and those. I mean, you, you hear it on there occasionally, but... Um, you know, we, we mostly use um, Q codes, but that's not the answer to this question. Uh, C, they are not permitted, and uh, that's not really well, we true either. That, we know that's not true. Because we, we use a lot of Q codes, so I'm going to say it's B. They may be used if they do not obscure the meaning of a message. I think that's right. And, well, that's mostly what we got over there in the chat room, although we did have a D, and I think he was probably <laughs> joking. <laughs> I think Kevin knows better than that. We do have a lot of ten four good buddies in there, though. Oh, yeah. I was expecting that. There you go. All right. Nailed it. When may an amateur station transmit communications in which the licensee or control operator has a pecuniary monetary interest. Is it A, when other amateurs are being notified of the sale of apparatus normally used in an amateur station and such activity is not done on a regular basis? B, only when there is no other means of communication readily available. C, when other amateurs are being notified of the sale of any item with a monetary value less than $200 and such activity is not done on a regular basis. Or D, never. Okay, so I, I think I know the answer. I, it's, I don't think it's D, because I'm pretty sure there's one similar list on the tech pool also. Um, yep, there is. B is not going to be it, only when there is no other means. That's, that doesn't matter. And I don't think there's a money limit on it. If... If you're like got a radio for sale and you want to offer it to somebody, but not having a swap shop every week or something, I, that's that's okay. It's, the answer is going to be A. When other amateurs are being notified of the sale of apparatus normally used in an amateur station, and such activity is not done on a regular basis. Yeah, that's so the that's going to be it. So the, the other one's very similar, but there's a limit of two hundred dollars on it. I don't think that's the case. Actually, yeah. I'm sure it's not. It's not in. And that's uh, in agreement with the chat room there. You are correct. And, you know, there's uh, trading nets on mm -hmm. HF. I think the Texas Traders Net is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, places that people get on there and say, well, I've got, you know, this particular boat anchor that, you know, I'm trying to get rid of or I'm looking for one. And people mm -hmm. will discuss some of the details there. As long as it's not on a regular basis. They're, you know, they're yeah. okay with that. How does the FCC require an amateur station to be operated in all respects not specifically covered by the Part 97 rules? A, in conformance with the rules of the IARU. B, in conformance with amateur radio custom. C, in conformance with good engineering and good amateur practice. And D, all of these choices are correct. Well, I think I know the answer to this one. You're looking a bit, a bit concerned there. No, I I think I know the answer too. I was just looking. This would be a little. This would be an easy one to get tripped up on. I think. Yeah. 
How does the FCC require an amateur station to be operated in all respects not specifically covered by the Part 97 rules? Well, it's not a uh, in conformance with the IARU. Mm -hmm. um, it's not B in conformance with amateur radio custom. So it can't be D. All of these choices are correct because we've already ruled out two of them. So that only leaves C in conformance with good engineering and good amateur practice. You know, that's the right answer. It may be, if you didn't know that, you might not guess that right off, but mm -hmm. uh, the FCC's uh, big on good engineering practices. From, oh, yeah. I know that from the commercial mm -hmm. uh, side of things. So it's, it's going to be C. And, well, we were a little mixed over there in the chat room on that one. Yeah. It it would be easy to to, uh, to get tripped up on that one, I think. It, it would. That would be, you know, I told you some of them were going to be a little tougher this mm -hmm. time around. Who or what determines good engineering and good amateur practice as applied to the operation of an amateur station in all respects not covered by the Part 97 rules? A, the FCC. B, the control operator. C, the IEEE. Or D, the ITU. Who or what determines good engineering and good amateur practice as applied to the operation of an amateur station and all aspects not covered by Part 97? Good amateur practice. It's not going to be the, I don't, the ITU or the IEEE. It's got to be the control operator. You think so? Well, the okay. FCC, they they have did Part ninety seven, so yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be B, the control operator. Well, let's see. There's a few folks that are saying B over in the the chat room there, and they are uh, wrong, just like you were. Bzz, yep. Yep. Well, I figured we were going to hear the buzzer. I told you there was, you know, <clears throat> and I thought this could be one of the ones right here. I I'll be honest. Uh, when I was entering the questions this time around, some of them kind of yeah. tripped me up a little bit. Yeah, uh, That sounds very misleading there. You would think, well, if the FCC doesn't cover it, then maybe it's off their books. But no, good engineering and a good amateur practice are determined by the FCC. Well... That's the first one I've had in a while, but it won't be the last, I'm sure. Well, you were due one. Yeah, I was you due. Know, you could trip me up on this one. All right, well, how about this one then? When is it permissible to communicate with amateur stations in countries outside the areas administered by the Federal Communications Commission? A, only when the foreign country has a formal third-party agreement filed with the FCC. B, when the contact is with amateurs in any country except those whose administrations have notified the ITU that they object to such communications. C. When the contact is with amateurs in any country as long as the communication is conducted in English. Or D. Only when the foreign country is a member of the International Amateur Radio Union. Well, I know the answer to this one, and it's a, it's a little confusing there, isn't it? Yeah, it could be a little bit tricky. Well, if we look at A there, and we're talking about when it's permissible to communicate with amateurs in another country, it's not regulated by the FCC, A, only when the foreign country has a formal third-party agreement filed with the FCC, no third party is is something else that's so not there's there's only two parties involved here you uh, the United States amateur station and another one that you're talking with uh, B when the contact is with amateurs in any country except those whose administrations have notified the ITU that they object to such communications that's your answer right there C, when the contact is with amateurs in any country as long as the communications is conducted in English. No, uh, that's, that's not a requirement. If, no. 
you know, if if you're talking, uh, uh, you know, someone who speaks Spanish and you know how to as well, y'all can communicate in Spanish. Or D, only when the foreign country is a member of the International Amateur Radio Union. No, that doesn't have anything to do with it. So what do you think? Am I right or yeah, wrong? Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Okay. Uh, just, mm, just about everybody got that one as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, at this point, I think we ought to uh, catch our breath, take a break, get a message from ICOM. Recharge the battery on the buzzer. Recharge the batteries. And tell everyone about their last opportunity to have a chance to win this great setup here. The you, one that I let go to sleep. Yeah, the one that went to sleep over there. There we go. Heard it, worked it, logged it. It's time to get the transceiver best suited for your lifestyle. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative products. See how you can make the most out of this contest season with one of these. Ideal for the ham on the go, the IC7300 is a high-performance HF transceiver with a compact design. Don't miss a weak signal with a combination of a waterfall function and real-time spectrum scope. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3 inch color touchscreen, real time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. The IC7851 will give you the competitive edge you've been looking for. Raise the bar and hear what others cannot with this HF 50 MHz transceiver. Reciprocal mixing dynamic, crystal clear local oscillator design, spectrum scope, dual receivers, digital voice recorder, and more. Can't wait for the IC7610? The IC7600 is still available and at a great price. Following in the footsteps of ICOM's flagship radio, the IC7600 offers intuitive operation and the latest DSP technologies. Digital IF filter, dual DSP, 5.8 inch, ultra wide TFT display, high resolution, real time spectrum scope, and more. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. I see something else has appeared on top of the yeah, radio. Yeah, some there. ICOM swag. We're going to give away an ICOM cap and an ICOM T-shirt. A ham crew ham T-shirt. Crew t-shirt. We've been trying to give away that T-shirt for how many years I now? I don't know. It's I'm about to wear it out just <laughs> holding it up here. It's going to have permanent crease marks in it. Yeah. But we have given away a lot of them, and uh, we're going to give away another one. Well, right now. Hey, how about yeah? How about now? It's as good yeah. a time as any, right? Well, yeah. While you're looking up the winner there, let me tell them how they can win. All you need to do, and you do need to do this, just go to your email client and send an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv and, you know, just tell us who you are. Give us your name or your call sign if you got one. You don't have to have a call don't sign. Don't have to have one. Uh, and you can, you know, give us a little information in the email as well. doesn't matter. It's not required. Nothing in particular. Just send us an email, and we'll put your name in the hat and do a random drawing every month. And I think you've got... And speaking of random drawing every month, mm -hmm. I've got one here. Uh, Dennis Cornell, N7HRO. Um, you won the hat and the t-shirt this month. And okay. uh, ICOM will be getting in touch with you to uh, get your size and where to ship it to. Yep. And you'll be looking sharp at the next ham fest. He will. Be looking very sharp. Well, I know there's some people that would like to have a radio to go along with that. Yeah, me too. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, not really. Well, and we've got a, a chance for you to win one. You know, we're coming up on the 12th anniversary of Amateur Logic. It is 12th, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It's hard to believe. It is, and uh, y you know, that's a that's a pretty good while for a video podcast. Tell me about it. Uh, it's a, after ten years, they kind of all start running together. Yeah, but it's still fun. It is. It's still very fun, and we want to thank uh, ICOM, NMFJ, and Howl Sound for once again sponsoring our uh, anniversary show for this year what we're going to have, 
is that new ICOM IC7300 over there. And this was not a field day radio. No, we this didn't take that one. This was brand new and straight out of the box. Yep. Uh, just specifically for this contest, mm -hmm. and we're going to ship that exact one to some lucky winner here. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, software-defined radio, probably the hottest thing on the market right now, especially in that category. Oh, yeah. Uh, a very nice rig. We're going to need some things to go with it. Absolutely. We're going to need a uh, cobweb antenna from MFJ. You can't have a radio without an antenna, right? It's the uh, MFJ 1835 five-band cobweb antenna, just like the one I used at Field Day this year. Of course, you're going to need some coax with it, so MFJ is going to give us a 100 foot of RG8X along with the connectors on it, but we're going to up that a bit. We're going to include these two no, beauties right here. No additional charge. <laughs> two faux gold PL259s, but we do not recommend putting RF through those. No, or a solder. Well, no, yeah. I'm not sure if they'd solder to even stick to that. <laughs> and you're going to need a power supply, so... We've got the uh, MFJ 4230 MVP right here below the headsets. Now, this is actually mine right here. I use it for, um, well, I, I've said it before, for field days, any outdoor uh, or portable activities, or anytime we need a 12-volt supply here on the bench. Mm -hmm. or, uh, just whenever. It's very small, handy, lightweight. And, you know, it seems to be pretty rugged because I've been using mm -hmm. it for several years as well. Yeah, it's a great little supply. Uh, it's got the uh, binding post here on the front, but also on the rear here. And I can't turn it around because we've got it wired in here. But there's a couple of set of power pole connectors on the rear. So it's, mm -hmm. it's ready to go for power poles as well. And those headphones I just moved, well, those, those go with this setup too. This is the Heil... Pro set IC. It's a nice set of Heil Pro sets with the microphone element specifically designed for ICOM radios by Bob. So uh, we've got complete setup there. You know, these make it so much easier mm -hmm. for contesting or, um, you know, operating special events and such because you don't have to keep picking up your microphone. You yeah, know, those are nice. I actually need to pick up one of those myself. Yep. So, now that we've told them what they could win, maybe we should tell them uh, where they need to look to get the rules, and then just go over a couple of the rules here. Uh, AmateurLogic.tv slash contest. Go there. You'll find a complete rundown on the prizes, the rules of the contest, and how to enter. But uh, first, let's go over the qualifications here. What's the first one there, Tommy? Well, first, you must be a licensed U.S. or Canadian amateur radio operator with a U.S. or Canadian shipping address. And only one entry per contestant. If you send more than one entry, then you're going to get disqualified. It'll happen, too, so don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the winner is responsible for any taxes incurred. And the winner agrees to the use of his or her call sign and name in promotional and news items related to the contest. And contestants must not be an employee or affiliate of Amateur Logic, ICOM, MFJ Enterprises, or Heil Sound. We've told you what you got to do to qualify. Uh, it doesn't have to be a general license. You can be a technician or uh, extra or advanced. And mm -hmm. I guess we'd even take a novice. Sure. Uh, any, as long as you're as long as you got a Canadian license. license yeah. How do they enter, Tommy? Well, you need to send an email to contest2017 at amateurlogic.tv with only your call sign in the subject line. Include your name, call sign, class of license, and your address in the email message. And submissions must be made between Wednesday, August 16th and Wednesday, October the 11th. 2017. That means it's getting pretty close getting here. Really close. Uh, how are we going to select a winner? Well, we're going to do it the same way we did it before. The, the contest winner is going to be selected by a random number from the entries received. The winner will be announced on the October 15th episode of AmateurLogic.tv. But if you watch us in the live stream, you'll find out a little sooner. 
Yep. Yep. Uh, and if for some reason we determined that the winning entry um, was didn't meet all the, the qualification requirements, then we'll just do the drawing again using the same method. Or just send the stuff to my place. No, we won't send it to Tommy's place. Okay, we'll just draw another one then. <laughs> and you can get all the contest rules and information at amateurlogic.tv slash contest. Go there today, learn more about it, and, you know, register. It's very simple to do. We don't collect these email addresses, addresses, or any of that information. No. After the contest is over, they all get deleted. Yep. So we're not harvesting email addresses here. All right. So... Uh, also, uh, when you send your email in, you'll get a response back. There's an autoresponder on that account, so you'll get a confirmation. If you don't get it, check your spam folder and, and make sure that it didn't get caught by there. Um, if you're still unsure, then uh, email one of us and let us know, and we'll be glad to check for you and make sure so you don't enter twice and get disqualified. All right, chat room, are you all ready to go as well? Well, too bad. <laughs> We're going anyway. <laughs> Which of the following would disqualify a third party from participating in stating a message over an amateur radio station? A, the third party's amateur license has been revoked and not reinstated. B, the third party is not a U.S. citizen. C, the third party is a licensed amateur. Or D, the third party is speaking in a language other than English. Which of the following would disqualify a third party from participating and start and stating a message over amateur station? This one's a little tougher. Third party amateur license. Okay, I, I'd say A is going to prevent it. B, third party is not a U.S. citizen. I don't think that matters. Third party is a licensed amateur. you're licensed, well, it doesn't say in the U.S., third party is speaking a language other than English, I think the answer is going to be A. If your license has been revoked and not reinstated, I don't think you should, you should be on the air at all. Even if uh, you're somebody else is the control operator of that station. In other words, when you got your license revoked. That's I, not going to get revoked. <laughs> I couldn't hand you the mic and, and let you be third party. I don't think you know. so. I, I think you're right. That That is kind of a tough one, though. You know, at first, you know, you, you think, well, the third party doesn't need a license. But, uh, hey, if, if you've been revoked, man, the FCC's washed their hands of you. Yep. You're not talking on yeah, any you, radio. You don't get on the air at all. You yep. lost your privileges. There you go. That was a tough one. Yeah. Yeah, these are, this uh, round of questions here is a little bit, uh, you got to think a little harder on them. Yeah. What types of messages for a third party in another country may be transmitted by an amateur station? A, any message as long as the amateur operator is not paid. B, only messages from other licensed amateurs. C, only messages relating to an amateur radio or remarks of a personal character or messages relating to emergencies or disaster relief. Or D, any message as long as the text of the message is recorded in the station log. And I'm going to knock out D automatically because you don't have to record messages. No. In your station logs. So, uh, we reviewed so that, knock that uh, one out. We reviewed that last mm -hmm. month, last month, I think. Or I the think one it before. was. Yeah. A. Any message as long as the amateur is not paid. You know that almost sounds good. If that was the case, not any. Any yeah. is the kicker there. Yeah. There's a bunch of stuff you just wouldn't want to relay on the air. Or you shouldn't. Or you shouldn't, even though if it was free. You know, it's still. Mm -hmm. There are certain things you should not say on air, so let's knock that one out of there. Uh, B, only messages for other licensed amateurs. Well, that doesn't seem just right either, because what if you're relaying uh, something for um, earthquake victims mm -hmm. or hurricane victims, you know? 
people you're talking to may not uh, have an amateur license. You're just doing health and welfare traffic. It's going to be C. Only messages related to amateur radio. That's okay. Remarks of a personal character. I guess that's okay, as long as they're not, um, you know, <laughs> not derogatory. Really, yeah. <laughs> or messages relating to emergencies or disaster relief, of course, on those two. So I say it's going to be C. That's what they're saying. Uh, and I the concur. Channel. Okay. Well, let's see. There you go. All right. C. Okay, we're well, whittling on down through these rules questions here. We're going to be finished with them here before you know it. Yeah, I, f I feel you. <laughs> with which foreign countries is third-party traffic prohibited, except for messages directly involving emergencies or disaster relief communications? A, countries in ITU Region 2. B, countries in ITU Region 1. C, every foreign country, unless there is a third-party agreement in effect with that country. Or D, any country which is not a member of the International Amateur Radio Union. Okay, you read this question, but uh, I answered the last one, so this is I know, really... I was trying to trip you up. <laughs> I see, I see <laughs> that. I'm glad you got this one, too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So, foreign country is third-party traffic prohibited, except for messages. Yeah, for emergency. Well, this one's. This is the only one. This don't see is the only one that makes sense. Countries in ITU region one or two that doesn't affect that. Any country which is not a member of the IARU, it's it's going to be C. Every foreign country, unless there is a third, what? Yeah, unless there's a third party agreement with that, in effect, with that country, it's going to go B C. And there's a lot of there's, well, there's only one person that answered that one, but he answered it three times, so it must be right. Oh, uh, okay. I thought there were several that answered it, but I could be wrong. That could have been hold over from the last one. Oh, uh, maybe. Uh, I don't know. C. I think you cheated on that one. How do you think I cheated? <laughs> I don't know, because that just that was too hard for it's you not, to that get. That was not hard. <laughs> if you read it, read the text of the message, it almost matches the question. With which foreign countries is third party traffic prohibited except for messages directly involving emergencies or disaster relief communications? Every foreign country is prohibited unless, unless there is a third-party third party agreement. agreement. It makes total sense to me. Yeah, it seems a little counter to one of the first questions we had, but I guess it didn't involve third-party traffic. I guess that's yeah, it a wasn't key a there. third party. Because you can talk to amateurs in any other country as long as that country has not filed an objection so we don't right. want you but not a third party agreement and i don't think there are many countries on that list no no nope, probably no. probably not yep i think north korea is one of them i don't remember the number name of the other one but uh, hmm. but sure. third party is okay well you got that one tommy you fooled me hey <laughs> pull a trick up my sleeve here and there <laughs> Still got one or two. Which of the following is a requirement for a non-licensed person to communicate with a foreign amateur radio station from a station with an FCC-granted license at which an FCC license control operator is present? <laughs> That's a long one. Mm -hmm. A, information must be exchanged in English. B, the foreign amateur station must be in a country with which the United States has a third-party agreement. Or C, the control operator must have at least a general class license. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Well, let's see. I'm supposed to answer this one, aren't I? Yeah. Which of the and thank goodness. <laughs> Which of the following is a requirement for non-licensed persons to communicate with foreign, foreign amateur radio station from a station with an FCC-granted license? 
at which an FCC license control operator is present. It is a long-winded question, mm-hmm. and what they say and they, what they don't say in there is any reference to third party in the question itself. Although a non-licensed person communicating would have to be a third party, mm-hmm. uh, you know there were two other licensed amateurs there. You know, one in each country, and the, this third party is unlicensed person, so. Information must be exchanged in English. We know that's not correct. It can be exchanged in other languages. Uh, B, the foreign amateur station must be a country with which the United States has a third-party agreement. I think we just more or less said that, didn't we? Yeah. So that's going to be it. But C, the control operator must have at least a general class license. No, that is that is not true. Um and of course, it's not D, so it's going to be B. And I'm surprised the chat room, everybody in there guessed B. Hey, which one thought, do you think it is? I think it is B. Which one do you think it is? I, th- I think it's B also. It's just the same as the last question, just reworded. Yep. They just didn't say third party in the question itself. No, it's implied, though. Yep, it's implied if you read it carefully. We got one more of these license type of questions to go here tonight. Oh, good, because I was going to have to get up and go get some Tylenol if we had very many more of those. Yep. (laughs) And I'll ask you this one, just because (laughs) you're having so much fun. What languages must be used when identifying your station if you're using a language other than English and making a contact using phone emission. A, the language being used for the contact. B, any language recognized by the United Nations. C, English only. D, English, Spanish, French, or German. I'm not 100% sure. It's either going to, it's either A or C, but because they specified English at the top, my hunch is going to say C. Go ahead and hit me with the buzzer. Okay. I just, well. Which one, what do you think it is? Uh, I know what it is. You do? Yeah. And I, I think we covered this one in the technician exam as well. Did I get buzzed on that one too? No. I could give you a half a buzz because you're pretty torn there on it. But Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to say it's C. Okay. I think, well. There you go. See, yeah, that was tough. We're going to come back in just a moment here. You can see we're going to talk about well, an oscillator, a and choke, a, and an oscilloscope. And an oscilloscope. Mm-hmm. How much fun is that going to be? That's going to be That's a blast. Be a lot. If you if you were looking for a good time, you came to the right place. Are you new to the ham world or an existing amateur operator who wants to take your license to the next level? Study for your radio license exam at hamstudy.org. Hamstudy.org is a free online learning tool powered by ICOM. It was created by Richard Bateman, KD7BBC, Michael Stuffelbean, KV9G, and Rich Porter, KK6GKE, and it uses a modern web design to enhance the experience of studying for your technician, general, and amateur extra exams. Since 2013, hamstudy.org has helped new and existing hams to familiarize themselves with the question pools, use stats-based flashcards to focus on material they need to learn, and take practice exams to gauge progress. Visit hamstudy.org on your desktop computer or mobile device. Register for a free account at hamstudy.org to access personalized study history and other site features. Prepare for an exam in an intuitive and comprehensive manner. Check out hamstudy.org powered by ICOM for free learning tools. Good luck on your next exam. Let the Radio Shack TRS-80 put the world of color computing into your home. Instant loading program packs turn any color TV into an exciting game arcade. And there's more. The color computer is an educational aid. 
own management tool. An up-to-the-minute electronic information service. The programmable, expandable TRS-80 color computer from $399 only at Radio Shack, the biggest name in little computers. Dum, 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 little dum, dum, little dum, dum, little dum, dum. There was a turtle by the name of Bert, and the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover, ducked and cover. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. Sure and remember what Bert the Turtle just did, friends, because every one of us must remember to do the same thing. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. This is an official civil defense film produced in cooperation with the Federal Civil Defense Administration and in consultation with the Safety Commission of the National Education Association. Produced by Archer Productions, Incorporated. Hey, Bert, come on out and meet all these nice people, please. Oh, all right. We really can't blame you. You see, Bert is a very, very careful fellow. When there's danger, this is the way he keeps from being hurt. Sometimes it even saves his life. That's why these children are practicing to duck and cover, just as you do in your school. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready for it just as we are ready for many other dangers that are around us all the time. Fire is a danger. It can burn whole buildings if someone is careless. But we are ready for fires. We have a fine fire department to put out the fire, and you have fire drills in your school so you know what to do. Automobiles can be dangerous, too. They sometimes cause bad accidents, but we are ready. We have safety rules that car drivers and people who are walking must obey. Now, we must be ready for a new danger, the atomic bomb. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? Duck and cover. Duck and cover. Duck and cover. Duck and cover. Those are pretty crazy commercials. The color computer one was pretty awesome. I, yeah. I had one of those, and I've actually still got single-sided floppy disk with some software that I wrote on that thing. Really? I still have the disk. I don't have anything to read them. You know, I didn't have a color computer. I went the C64 route, and I, I you know, I should have had a color computer too, but... Yeah, well, the Commodore 64 was a lot more capable. Yeah. Uh, I had, and I gave, I had two or three of them, and I ended up giving them all away along with my software, and I'd written a lot of stuff for it. You oh, know? you didn't even keep a copy of any Didn't of keep it? a copy of it. And well, you see how much good mine's doing yeah. me. It's in a box at home. Well, you may hear a little noise in the background here that wasn't there before. That's because I have fired up my uh, Rigol DS-1054 scope here. And those things are known for having noisy fans in them. Yeah, it's pretty loud. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've got the Tektronix up there, and it's way bigger than this. Gets a way lot hotter, and it doesn't really make nearly this much noise. So. It takes a lot more room on the desk, <laughs> It takes a lot too. more room on the desk, too. I've got an audio oscillator. I've got a choke, and I've got an oscilloscope. We're going to run the output of that audio oscillator into one side of an inductor. We're going to run that to one channel of the scope so we can look at the signal coming out of the oscillator. And then we're going to hook the other probe of the scope to the output of the inductor and measure that on the scope as well. So we're going to see what that audio signal looks like going into the inductor and what the inductor does, how it comes out. Okay. This ought to be interesting. I've got the oscillator here set for a square wave because that's going to make this easiest to demonstrate. 
And I don't know why, but I got a little uh, rounding here on the um, leading edge of my traces, and I couldn't adjust it out with the trimmer actually on the scope. It may be the. It could the be the oscillator. Coming out of the, uh, I mean, this is. It's like you a know, twenty. Twenty-two dollar oscillator, because I know, because I got one just like it. You bought it on sale, then, because I think I paid uh, forty-nine dollars for this. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't think I gave that much. About twenty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's just a cheap little oscillator. I've got a better one too, but this is I use this more than anything else because it's so compact well, it and convenient. It fits on the table. Yep. And we're not particularly interested in distortion for this. So there's a square wave. How many hertz have I got this on? 640 times 100. That's what's coming out of the oscillator here, going into the inductor. Now I have hooked it up, and the reason I have that drawing is because it, you know, it's really hard to see exactly what I've got there. But the drawing I had a moment ago is what we're actually doing. Now, in honesty, this is a transformer. But we're just using the secondary of it, which we're using it as an inductor. I just needed an inductor this mm -hmm. big to really show you on the scope easily what we were looking at. So I'm just using the half of the transformer as an inductor. All right, channel one here on the scope. That's the signal leaving the oscillator going into the inductor. Square wave. Let's look at... Channel 2. What do you think it's going to look like on Channel 2, Tommy? Uh, wow. Like cursive writing? That's a lot that's different. Kind of, yeah, it? that's very different. That's not exactly what I was expecting to see. It, it's not. Let's overlay our original trace there. Wow. You can see it's the same signal because it repeats you know, exactly the same intervals. Mm-hmm. What yeah. is? Why is it doing that? Well, I'm glad funny you asked that question. It's funny that I asked, huh? Yeah, it's a <laughs> you know convenient time to ask too, and well, I'm glad you did. Things just work out like that sometimes. They do. You almost think it was planned. <laughs> <laughs> An inductor tries to oppose a change in current through it. It does this with the magnetic field that's surrounding the inductor. As the current drops, the field collapses and increases the voltage across it and as a current increases the inductor tries to bulk that change in current by decreasing the voltage. As we're applying a, a square wave here into that inductor you can see where where it ends and begins sharply and, and real defined. So when the square wave starts to rise, it hits that inductor, and that inductor says, wait a minute, I don't want to change, so it tries to hold it down. But as the time period continues, then it, it ramps on up to the maximum voltage. Then when, you, when that particular cycle ends, that inductor says, wait a minute, you can't quit yet. You can't swing negative. So it tries to hold it up. The magnetic field in that inductor collapses yeah. on itself. Oh, and and cool. it does it as long as it can. And then it, you know, it discharges and bleeds them down. Not really like a capacitor. It's a magnetic field in the inductor that's doing that. And then it hits the next cycle, uh, goes through the same thing. You know, the inductor is trying to hold constant there and doesn't always really uh, you know do a, a super good job of it uh, in this case anyway now yeah this is more pronounced at different frequencies if I change the frequencies here there there's really a, a good uh, example of it right there that, that makes it a little easier to mm -hmm. see yeah it's 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 trying to hold it constant on both sides but you know um, that's why an inductor is so useful you know it, it can be used for a lot of different electronic circuits uh, the the most recent case I looked at it was in that pine board transmitter that Bob Hiles building mm -hmm. uh, it's using Heising modulation which uses an inductor in there 
and that's how they get the modulation okay. on, on to the uh, first thing transfer. that comes to my mind I think about it is like a voltage booster yep it could be used for that mm -hmm. because it's that field is collapsing every time and and when it does the magnetic field's got to go somewhere so it just tries to rush back in mm -hmm. and comes out the winding yeah, it's, turn. it's a really fascinating yeah. concept. I'm not going to say I just did the best explanation of an inductor every uh, done before, but, you know, I had come up with something quick and, but and it that looks you could cool. see. It looks cool. It, it does really look cool, you know. You get points. You get points for that, you know. Yeah, actually, sure. I should. No, you did uh, good. Yeah. should just the voltage to be more somewhere there but anyway you, you get the idea there you can make some nice looking uh, designs with it too <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all it counts yeah. okay no. uh, marty is asking would that be an example of capacitive reactance no that's inductive reactance that we we were uh talking about but we're not talking about reactants yet but marty owned something that's going to be next episode oh yeah yep we'll be getting on to i'll reactants. bring those style and all then for this episode though we have we don't have many questions left here but we've got a few and uh tommy is preparing some visuals for us over there because we're going to need them what is the inductance of three 10 millihenry inductors connected in parallel. Is it A, 0.3 henrys? B, 3.3 henrys. C, 3.3 millihenrys. Or D, 30 millihenrys. This is for me? That's for you. Let's, let's look at the formula. I got the answer. You do? Yeah. It's going to be C, 3.3. 3.3 millihenries. At least I think it is. I think it works about the same way as the resistors do. All right, well, let's look at the <coughs> formula over here because okay. we wanted to talk about that. Two inductors in parallel there. Our formula is the total inductance equals 1 over L1, the in inductance of the first okay. one, plus what were the values? 1 over L2, and then take the reciprocal of that. The values are uh, 10 millihenries. So you take 1, yep, divided by 10. One All right, one. and you do that three times and add them together. So, so 0 0.1 so plus so. 0 0.1 plus. Yeah, I don't like that calculator either because it. Well, it is 0 0.3. So it's 0 0.3. Okay. And then I uh, want to divide by point three. Yep. Three point three 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 three. So yeah, Tommy, you were right. You know, that's the same formula as I think about it as that's, resistors. That's what it? I said. Yep. The same as resistors. Mm -hmm. So they basically treat them as values mm -hmm. basically the same way. It's the opposite of capacitors, <clears throat> mm -hmm. more or less. So. All right, we've got another question then, just to, to keep it interesting. However, this one's going to be on series inductors. L total equals L1 plus L2. Simple enough, plus L3, 4, 5, 6, on and on. You know, however many uh, series inductors mm -hmm. you got there. You can think of that as just like, you know, an inductor is a coil. If you just keep adding more inductors, you're just adding you more turns increase? to that coil. Uh -huh. So. Uh, very very easy to remember that one. So what is the inductance of a 20 millihenry inductor connected in series with a 50 millihenry inductor? Want me to answer this one too? Well, no, I'll, I, I, I it think doesn't I really do matter. It. But we already know this is pretty simple. Yeah, a 0 0.07 millihenries. B 14.3 millihenries. C 70 millihenries. Or D 1,000 millihenries. So all we got to do is add 50 and 20, and we got 70 millihenries. So that's going to be C. 
And you know, everybody got that in the chat room, and I'm I'm glad they did because we just explained how you come up with it, and it's pretty and easy to add. Second grade 50 math, and 20. first yeah. grade math. Yeah. Which of the following components should be added to an inductor to increase the inductance? Hmm, we had a question like this uh, on capacitance last time Somewhat around. Somewhat familiar. Is it A, a capacitor in series? B, a resistor in parallel. C, an inductor in parallel. Or D, an inductor in series. So which of the following components should be added to an inductor to increase the inductance? So that's going to be D, an inductor in series, because we just actually, went to, mm -hmm. last question did exactly that. Yep, everybody's getting that <clears> right <throat> over in the chat room too. Um, so yeah, that's uh, pretty straightforward there. Same as series resistor formula, basically. Uh, just add inductors, two inductors to increase the inductance. What would happen if you added a capacitor in series with it? That's a good question. I'm not sure. It would decrease the inductance. It'd decrease? Because it's exactly the opposite of an inductor. So. Uh, oh, that's, that's right. Yeah. That makes sense. So, as a matter of fact, in a lot of uh, AM broadcast matching networks, they'll have like a T network with inductors and capacitors in that little doghouse that's at the bottom of the tower. And they didn't have a lot of variable capacitors back in the early days. So most of them are designed to where a circuit has a capacitor in there. If they think they need to vary the value of that capacitor, they'll put an inductor in series with it, a tapped inductor, oh, and they'll just tap the off that. Yep, they'll tap off that inductor to change the value of the capacitance. That's cool. So yeah, neat. It all works out. So Tommy, I think that is that's all the questions we got for tonight. Yeah, but there were some good ones. There were some good ones and some tough ones at the beginning. There. We had a buzz. We had buzz going, buzz going on and all kind of stuff. So Yeah, and you don't get that every month. No, we don't. Mm -mm. But uh, I think we well, may begin to. Well, we kind of look forward to it when we do. Well, not really, but... <laughs> Uh, we, uh, but it's going to okay. happen. It's going to happen. You know, these general questions are a little harder than those technician ones were, but still not insurmountable. And we encourage you, you know, to do not just your ham college studies here. You know, we, we try hard to prepare people to take their license exam, but there's other resources you should be using as well. One is hamstudy.org. It's mm -hmm. a it's Excellent a great site. online site to study for your exam, and it's free. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's a great resource. As great well resource. as our friend Gordo, Gordon West, has a series of books for your general, extra, and technician. Com commonly referred to as the Book of Gordo. The Book of Gordo. So, even though it's several books, yeah. But Gordo goes into a lot of detail in these. It's not just questions and answers. He gives you the background on the answers, mm -hmm. too. So um, very good study material. You won't only learn the answers to the questions. You'll learn some of the background and why that's the answer. Yeah, yeah, that's great stuff. So, yeah, it is. Okay, before we go here, let's, uh, well, we've got a couple of things to mention. You know, when I read those in, those descriptions in those books for the questions, you know, just glancing through them, you can almost hear Gordo. You can. His voice when you read it. If you know Gordo, yeah. Uh -huh. You can. You really can. Well, Tommy, if folks wanted to join in and communicate with us throughout the month, where could they do that? Well, just so happen to have a list right here on the screen right now. Mm -hmm. So we've got our Facebook group at uh, facebook.com slash group slash amateurlogic.tv. And we've got our Google Plus group. Uh, just go to Google Plus. It's a community over there and just search for Amateur Logic. Yeah, we also have right a Ham up. College group on there. We do for Ham College. Yeah, and we're also on Twitter at mm -hmm. Amateur Logic and at Ham College. Yep. Although we're not super active on there, but uh, we are there. Yeah, we mostly use it as a platform to announce when the next 
live episode is going to be recorded so that you, those who want to watch and uh, uh, feel like they can take the whole experience, <laughs> uh, we let them know in advance that, hey, we're, we're shooting it this weekend. On yeah. So if, you, uh, if you're concerned about missing the notifications, yep. subscribe to those on Twitter and mm -hmm. you can uh, have them pop up on your phone or whatever. Yep. And if you want show notes, you can find those amateurlogic.tv slash wiki. Our friend Dan Van Evenhoven in 9LVS does those for us every month. Yeah, it does a great job. Really appreciate him doing that. Yep. Yeah, we do. So, uh, thanks for joining us for another episode. We'll be back next month, and I've already kind of given away part of what we're going to talk about is going to be reactants. That should be fun. So it Should, will can't be. Can't wait to see the reactions from that. Yeah, those formulas are going to get increasingly harder. Great. So uh, I know you're looking forward to that. Oh yeah, it's all fun. <laughs> it is. All right, seven three, everyone. Thanks for being here. Yep, seven three. What are the restrictions on the use of abbreviations and procedural signals in the amateur service? That's not what it says up there. You're right.